thank you for being here. Thank you for your faithfulness to the Lord's work in many, many areas. I just got back from my sojourn on Wednesday night at about 11 o'clock, and uh, it's good to see all of you. Good to see all of you. I have missed seeing you. And uh, thank you for your prayers. Uh, as you know, Catherine and I were in Hawaii, and uh, 72 hours before leaving, I had a positive test. And that is a terrible thing, but thank the Lord it was very light, and, uh, and uh, I had to be in a hotel for, for 10 days, one approved by the state of Hawaii. And, uh, and I'm not going to get much sympathy because I wasn't quarantined in Anchorage, Alaska, okay? <laughs> so I'm not, I don't expect much currency of, of sympathy here. But uh, uh, the hotel manager shouted at me twice to get back in my room when I was just trying to say goodbye to this young lady who was on her way back, and I did obey <laughs> and got back into my room. And five days of isolation, and then five days, because Canada wouldn't let me in for 10 days. And so uh, I just wandered around the industrial area <laughs> around the hotel, and I, it, was, it, was, it was a very nice hotel. I can't, I can't claim poverty there. But, uh, and I had, I had food from food trucks. Thir food trucks were parked beside the hotel and I had some I had some good food folk I can tell you where to go okay <laughs> so we do appreciate the wonderful work of brother Bill here and I haven't been pulling my weight for the last couple weeks so Bill thank you very very much for your your good good work some insights into preaching a couple of just there aren't secrets from preachers but they are very important, and I tell these to my, my preaching students. So I'm sharing with you a little bit right at the beginning of the here about, about preaching, and uh, you might be bored by it, but then again, you might find it insightful. I, I, I tell my students, first of all, that all of life is possible preaching material for a preacher. Be aware of all of life and what it's saying to you. And secondly, the sermon has to speak First to the preacher, and then to the congregation. And this message, and I believe it is a word from the Lord, has spoken to me very, very powerfully. And I do pray and hope it does speak to you. So let's go. We're talking about rest assured today, and we're going to pray and ask for the Lord's blessing on these words. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to deliver these truths today. I pray, dear Father, that your spirit will take the truths and bless them. Bless them to those that are live here in Delta Pentecostal Church and those who are online today. May you bless them wherever they are in the world. And thank you for your faithfulness. In Jesus' name, amen. Talking about rest assured today, those two little words really speak to me. When I contracted COVID in, in Maui, as I said, I had to quarantine for five nights and then an additional five. Catherine had flown back to Canada. And in the hotel where I stayed in Maui, I immediately noticed as I came into the room, there was a little printed card that caught my attention in a very, very strong way. The bold type in capital letters at the top of the card had these two words. It said, rest assured. And this is the card that I brought back as a souvenir from Hawaii. Rest assured. And then the wording on the card went on to say, why? Why do you need to rest assured? And what are they trying to assure? Well, it described, obviously, COVID protocols protecting the guests. It was, was very detailed in what it said. It talked about disinfecting of bathroom surfaces, buttons, knobs, switches, door handles, and TV remote. The details caught my attention as to why I should rest assured. I believe that the Lord took this little card and spoke to me to bring a message to you of encouragement here at Delta Pentecostal Church. As children of God, 
through our relationship with Jesus Christ, we can now and eternally rest assured. Wow. That is one of the great blessings of being a Christian, folk. I'm delighted I'm a Christian today. I'm delighted for many, many reasons, but you'll see three of them as we go along here. Our past, present, and futures are all covered off within the care of Jesus Christ. And that's the confidence that we walk in today, that our, all, of our, all of that happened to us and will happen to us are covered off in an amazing relationship of Christian faith. Now, we live in a world where we uniquely need care, where we uniquely need the assurance and the protection of our eternal Heavenly Father. Because I believe that there are probably more challenges at this time in history than at any time in recent memory that I have experienced. Let me just give you a few of them, okay? You're aware of all of them. I'm not here to depress you. But there's the possibility of war between Russia and Ukraine. That's big stuff, folk, especially when nukes are involved. Secondly, there's the possibility of endless new variants of COVID-19, and we've just come through two years of lockdown. Folk, that is extremely troubling. There's significant drug and homeless issues in our society. You just have to go a few miles here down to Hastings Street, and you will see literally hundreds of impoverished people suffering from drug and mental issues there. It's a tragic situation, a tragic scene just within our own city here. And then there are significant issues of loneliness in our society. Technology says that we can stay connected today in a better way. And technologically, we can. But here's the irony. There are these great advances in technology, but people are probably lonelier than ever in our society. That's the reality of the situation. In fact, in the UK, the government, the federal government, has created an official ministry of loneliness where there is actually a cabinet minister who deals with this. And they've created what are called welcome benches around Britain where the sign welcome benches is there. And if you need somebody to talk to, sit on this bench and somebody else will come along and talk with you. We live in a, situ a, a society where there's techno technology bringing us together and yet unprecedented loneliness. And many Canadians, the tragedy is to say, are forsaking the church in this time in our society. I was reading an interesting stat that says that over the next decade, they predict that 9,000 what are called religious spaces or church buildings will be closed down in our country. 9,000 is a lot, folks. And so we have these tremendous needs in our world. David Brooks is a, a very insightful columnist for the New York Times who I really enjoy reading. He is an American. I know the situation in America is not exactly parallel to Canada or identical, but there are parallels. And David Brooks very insightfully wrote a column which said this, quote, America is falling apart at the seams. As a columnist, I'm supposed to have some answers, but I don't have them right now. I just know the situation is dire. Well, enough for negativity in this sermon. Hopefully I'm not a doom and gloom preacher, but it's important to be a realist. The rest of the sermon will be positive. In today's world with these massive problems, as Christ followers, we can legitimately rest assured. We're at a point, I believe, where this resting assured should be treasured by us, should be celebrated by us, should we should thank the Lord for in an amazing way more than any other time in our world. Our assurance is based on three portions of Scripture that personally speak to me, and there may be other portions of Scripture that give you great assurance, and that's wonderful. Choose them, follow them, live by them. But these are three portions of Scripture that personally speak to me in a very, very profound way, and they're actually foundation points for my life. 
and at different points have spoken to me and continue to speak with me. I find these verses to be these foundation points, and as I look around our world with, with its problems, the amazing truth of these verses are an amazing and wonderful and firm foundation for living for me. And I hope they are for you as well. Well, first of all, we can rest assured for the past. The past is very important. We all have a past. And you can't escape your past. You can't just walk away from it and say, well, let's just ignore it. But 1 John 1, 7 to 9 are amazing verses talking about our past. The blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all, all sin. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. I love the repetition of the word all in these verses. All means all. The reason is that all of us have sinned in the past and all of us will sin at some time in the future. So these verses become tremendously meaningful to us. I define sin as falling short of God's best. Falling short of God's best. And we have to admit, if we're honest, there have been times, all of us in the past, where we've fallen short of God's best. And probably at some time in the future, we will as well. So when we're in this vital relationship with Jesus, all of the falling short of God's best is covered off with our creator and judge according to these verses. This, these verses became very, very powerful to me when I, when I was 14 years old, maybe 13, 14, I don't remember exactly the age, but I, I was feeling under a burden of guilt for some point, and I don't really even know why. And my father, who was, was very insightful and, and loved the Lord in a, in a very practical, down-to-earth way, was talking to me and was asking me about this. And he pointed me to these verses in 1 John. 1 John chapter 1, 7-9. And they took on great meaning for me at that point. Uh, my father's handwriting was absolutely abominable. <laughs> you couldn't read his handwriting, let me tell you that literally. So he took a little white card out and he printed the words of these verses on this card. And I carried this card for many, many years in my wallet as something I could come back to as an assurance of the past, that the past was covered off through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The, Lord, the Old Testament, as I said, teach, it teaches that sin is breaking God's law, so it's falling short of God's best. Sin is real. Let's begin with that. Sin is not a trivial matter, as our society says. Sin cannot be blown off, as people say in our world. Just ignore it and walk away and don't be concerned. No, we should be concerned about our past, but we are not bound by our past as believers in Jesus Christ. And that is a very realistic way of living. Sin requires a sacrifice where blood is shed. Blood represents life because we can't live without our blood. While we can live without many other of our physical functions like our arms or our legs, you can't live without blood. So there is the sacrifice of blood that God requires because this represents life. And it is that wonderful overarching symbol. And the Old Testament blood sacrifices, however effective they were, were only temporary. They were looking forward to the perfect sacrifice of Christ. The Old Testament blood sacrifices were temporary in the sense that they were merely animals, but nonetheless they pointed forward to Jesus. The New Testament teaches us that Christ is the perfect sacrifice, wiping away all of our sins through his shed blood. Now, why is he the perfect sacrifice? Why was he much so much better than these Old Testament sacrifices? Christ is both God and man. That is a basic cardinal Christian truth. Something hard to wrap your head around, but it is true. We don't have to understand all truth to believe it. And so we recognize that in Christ, God is both making 
and receiving the sacrifice at the same time. You see where I'm going with this? If Christ is both God and man, God is both making the sacrifice and receiving the sacrifice to cover our sins. And here's the wonderful truth. God will do enough to satisfy his own laws and wipe out our sins. That's a wonderful and exciting truth. God will do enough. There's never a deficiency in the bank account. There's never an overdraft for the child of God where we say our sins are too much for God to handle. No, there's no overdraft in your account, folk. There's no overdraft in your account. God will do enough to satisfy his own requirements. It's similar to a judge in a court of law fining somebody $500 for some infraction they've done, and then he or she takes out their wallet and says, here's the $500, I pay it for you. That's the wonderful truth that Scripture teaches. And it's, it's only possible because of the deity of Christ, and he is fully God. Now, the, the, the truth about Jesus is challenging in many ways to understand. When, when it comes to Jesus' humanity, we, we can pretty much grasp that because we're human. We can understand humanity, and we can understand it when it says that Jesus was human. Okay, he was a baby, and he cried. We know that because we know babies and they all cry. He walked the roads in Palestine with his disciples. He slept and ate like we do. The humanity of Christ is, is easily accepted in our world, but it is crucial that he also be deity in order to be the perfect sacrifice. And this is where it's hard to wrap our heads around. We don't have to totally understand it, folk. It's just a matter that we believe it. It says in John 1.14, the word referring to Christ as deity became flesh and lived for a while among us. The message says the word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. If I was cool this morning, I'd say it moved into the hood. Okay, the word, Jesus Christ, God and man pitched his tent 33 years on this earth, living a life just like us. The, the miracles of Christ are amazing. And I, I want to just highlight some of the miracles of Jesus in the Gospel of John. They were done certainly to, to relieve suffering, and I don't want to diminish this. Jesus Christ is concerned about our suffering. But there's a second reason for the miracles that is equally important, and that is the miracles of Christ proved his deity, because we have trouble accepting his deity. The Jewish leaders rebelled against the deity and totally rejected this. And people in our world can't wrap their head around the deity. Give me the human Jesus, but not the divine Jesus. But the divine Jesus is equally important to the human Jesus. And let me just summarize some of the miracles in the Gospel of John because they, they just give us a wonderful snapshot of the deity of Christ and the scope of his deity. Well, first of all, his first miracle was the changing of the water into wine at the wedding of Cana of Galilee. That is an amazing miracle where Jesus created new wine which was better than the original wine. Well, what is this miracle showing? It shows that Jesus is a master of quality as being divine. Second miracle, the healing of the nobleman's son. It's, it's fascinating that this nobleman came and said, Jesus, come and heal my son. He's dying. And Jesus spoke the word and the boy was healed, and he was a number of kilometers away, and the healing occurred when Jesus spoke it. What does that show? It shows that Jesus being divine is the master of distance or space. He is not limited by space, and only God is unlimited by space or distance. Then there's the healing of the, of the man at the pool of Siloam. This guy had been tragically, tragically infirmed, for 38 years, and Jesus healed him. Now, what does this show? It shows that Jesus Christ is the master of time. 38 years didn't matter to him. 
that this guy had been sick for that length of time. Then we go on to the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000, which is a truly amazing, very physical miracle. Jesus takes this, this little lunch from this little boy and he ends up multiplying the loaves and the fishes so that it feeds 5,000 people and there are 12 baskets left over after this. It shows that Jesus Christ being God is the master of quantity. Unlimited quantity he has to bless his people with. And then there's the walking on the water where there's this huge and ferocious storm going on. And the disciples are scared spitless, as they should be, that their boat is going to be swamped. And lo and behold, here comes Jesus walking on the water. And Jesus calms the water, and it shows that he is the master of natural law. No natural law can overtake him and his power. Then there's the healing of the man born blind, which shows that Jesus is the master of all misfortune. And finally, the raising of Lazarus from the dead, where Jesus is the master of death. Well, the wonderful truth is then, Jesus is God. And so our sins can be forgiven through his sacrifice. So you and I can rest assured from the past. You and I can secondly rest assured for the present. And this comes from Jeremiah chapter 29. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, the Jewish best and brightest are in captivity under Nebuchadnezzar's yoke in Babylon here. When 70 years are completed, I will come to you and fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back to Palestine, to Jerusalem. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Wow. That is a tremendous promise, folk, that we can rest assured on. We can rest assured in the present that the Lord's plans will be worked out in our lives. In this portion, as I said, the best and the brightest taken into Babylon. The Is these Israelites are in captivity, and they're seriously frustrated. They're seriously challenged in their faith in God, because you see, they've been taught very clearly that they are the chosen people of God, and that Israel-Palestine is his chosen nation to be a light to the world. Now that's very, very important. It's not a selfish thing, okay? Because sometimes we, we see it that way. No, it's to be a light to the world. And here they are carted off into captivity in Babylon. And what are they doing there? Their faith is very seriously challenged. And, and that's understandable for that to happen. There's this captivity brought on by this pagan empire. And they're supposed to be chosen by God. Do we ever in our lives question whether we, as the chosen of God, and why we are experiencing the difficulties we are experiencing. I think all of us have had that situation where we are taught and rightfully taught that we're joint heirs with Jesus Christ. We are children of God. We are born again. We're on our way to heaven. And then, lo and behold, there are problems that come our lives. There are sicknesses that come into our lives. There are financial difficulties. There are emotional issues that come into our lives. Disappointment and sickness and, and all kinds of family stress. And we are often in a questioning mode as the children of Israel were. Well, let me stress, first of all, the Lord doesn't, doesn't condemn us for questioning. Questioning is human. Questioning is something that is a very real thing in our lives, but I believe we can get beyond the questioning in our present circumstances. All of us have experienced disappointment in our lives, and that seems to be part of the package of life. After I had been president of Summit for a number of years, a headhunter contacted me asking me if I'd be interested in letting my name stand for the position of President of the Evangelical Fellowship of Canada. Uh, you're maybe not familiar with the EFC, but it, it is a wonderful organization. It is a liaison between the evangelical churches in Canada and the federal government in Ottawa. 
It presents evangelical Christian views to the government, and I'm very much in favor of letting our voice be heard. I said I'd, I'd let my name be considered and that I'd come down to Toronto for an interview. The, the ministry interested me because uh, before studying theology, I studied history and political science at University of Toronto and loved it, just loved it, and, and was intrigued by how the interaction of government and Christianity should happen. Catherine and I prayed about it, and we believed that I should go for the interview. I well remember the night before I went to Toronto, we were praying about this matter and committing it to him, and we were in our family room at 2302 Woodstock Drive in Abbotsford. And amidst our praying and amidst our worshiping, we were, we were singing with a CD that was on the machine, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. And we were assured that Jesus was ours even in this situation. I flew to Toronto, had the interview, thought it went well. Later, the chair of EFC, Dr. Paul Magnus, who I had gone to seminary with, actually, at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, called me to say that I had come in second for the position. To be honest, I was disappointed. There are going to be things in life, folk, that disappoint you. Disappointment came to the children of Israel when they were in captivity in Babylon. Two of the greatest characters in Scripture experienced real disappointment. So if we have disappointment, we shouldn't be shocked or overcome by it and say, as, as believers in Jesus, there should be no disappointment. No, when you look at Moses and you look at David, two of the greatest characters in history, there was disappointment in their lives. And Moses, as we've heard from Pastor Bill here so well, led the children of Israel out of, out of Egyptian captivity. What a man of God leading the whole nation out of captivity. He then experienced an amazing interaction with God where he went to the top of Mount Sinai and received the Ten Commandments. No other human being has ever experienced that before, before or nor will anyone afterwards. So you would think to yourself, you know, such a man of God, surely he is able and allowed to enter the promised land. No, because there was an occasion where he struck the rock in anger and the Lord said, Moses, you won't enter the land, you will only see it. And he went up on top of Mount Nebo and so on. I'm sure Moses was disappointed at that point. David was another of the great men of God, wonderful worshiper of the Lord. The composer of, of, of most of the Psalms and the Psalms of worship are just so amazing. Psalms is one of my favorite books in the Bible because it's pretty easy for me to apply it which is why I enjoy it. And you would think that this great worshiper after the Lord would be able to build a temple for the Lord. The Lord said, no, David, you're a man of war and only a man of peace will build a temple for me. Well, we recognize then that disappointment is part of the package of life for most of us. But there are three great portions that are, are so, three great truths that are so uplifting coming out of this portion. Number one, when you look at this Jeremiah portion, you see it is the Lord of the universe who is making the promise. Uh, promises are important, but we recognize that promises are totally based on the person making the promise. If somebody says, I promise to give you a million dollars and all they have is $50 in your bank account, I'm sorry, that promise isn't very good. So you, we see here in this Jeremiah portion, it is the Lord of the universe who is making the promise. That becomes the first important point. Not a human prophet, not a priest or a king who is speaking. Secondly, the trials in our lives, the disappointments in our lives, have an expiry or a drop-dead date. And that is very, very important for us to understand there. When 70 years are completed, I will bring you back to the promised land. There is an expiry date on the problems of life. There is a drop-dead date on the issues that we face. They are not there forever. 
And that is what gives me tremendous assurance. Jeremiah 29, 10, when 70 years are completed for Babylon. The Babylonian captivity was not endless and neither are the trials in our lives. And thirdly, there's a real and active plan that the Lord has to bless us, not to harm us. And we hold on to that. Verse 11 says to the exiles in Babylon, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, and plans to give you hope and a future. Folk, those are amazing truths that I rest assured on in this present day and age. And you can rest assured of them so much in the same way. Um, my mind goes to flying in airplanes because I just got off one. And when you're flying in a, in a Boeing Dreamliner plane, a beautiful plane we happen to go on to Hawaii, it, it's a wonderful to know that the captain of the plane has a flight plan. He is not just kind of flying around in the blue skies over the Pacific between here and Hawaii. Wonderful clouds you see out there, a little bit of water down there. But the amazing and wonderful truth, the really significant truth is that the captain of this plane does have a plan. He's not up here just for a joyride for a few hours and then we're going to crash somewhere in the waves of the Pacific. He has a plan to get us to Maui. And basically what Jeremiah 29 says is this, the captain on the plane of life in which the children of God are now flying has a plan. There'll be some turbulence. There'll be some rough times. But he has a plan, and that is what this firmly, firmly says to me. The God of the universe, one infinitely wiser and more experienced than any airline pilot, has a plan for his children. Well, thirdly and finally, we rest assured for the future. And this is a wonderful truth that just excites me beyond measure. John 14, 1 to 3, do not let your hearts be troubled, Jesus says to his disciples. Trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. And here's the key, I am going there to prepare a place for you. Jesus is about to leave his disciples for the cross. They are bewildered, they are confused, they are upset, they're disappointed, they don't know how to handle this stuff that Jesus is talking about, about going through the trials of the cross. They looked for Jesus to be a political deliverer. They looked for him to overthrow the brutal Romans, to set up a new kingdom where he'd be the king of Palestine and they'd be the foreign secretary and the minister of commerce and the minister of justice in his new government. And now Jesus is saying, my life is going to come to an end and they are absolutely confused by this. In this context of bewilderment and confusion, Jesus talks about eternity and where we go after we die. If the Lord doesn't return for his children, and if we don't experience the rapture first, all of us in this room are going to die. How many of you disagree with that statement? <laughs> Nobody does. But we all have questions then about what happens after we breathe our last breath. Where do we go? Do we immediately go to heaven? Do we go to a place called paradise and there wait for the believers, other believers, to join us in heaven? Rick Watt, Australian Pentecostal, makes this absolutely wonderful point that has just blessed me since I heard it for the first time a year or so ago. Based on John chapter 14, he says this, and this is the key. Hope you remember this. The right question concerning people who die is not where they are, but who they are with. Folk, that's the key. The right question is who they are with. And they are with Jesus. If they have joined forces with Jesus on this life, they are with Jesus. And that is such an amazing and blessed truth to me. 
It came very powerfully in a very real way this week. Because just this past Friday of January the 28th, my 97-year-old uncle Lloyd Crawford Hicks passed away in St. Catharines, Ontario. He was not a perfect man. He lived in a flawed life in many ways. But he loved Jesus intensely. And I know with certainty that he is with Jesus. And folk, that is something that you can base your life on. Jesus said the same thing when he was on the cross. He said to the the thief on the cross who believed in him, today you will be with me in paradise. The right question concerning people who die is not where they are, but who they are with. For the believer, that answer is Jesus. A few years ago, and I conclude after this little story. I I was teaching at a Bible college in Moscow in Russia. For reasons of wanting to save money, I flew on Aeroflot from (laughs) Seattle to Moscow. I'll never fly on Aeroflot again, no matter how little money I have. Let me just assure you of that point. And uh, the flight over was okay. The flight coming back on Aeroflot was coming from Moscow to SeaTac Airport in Seattle. And we were about to land, okay? And we're only about maybe 30 meters off the ground. And we were looking out the window. There was a guy sitting beside me right at the window. And suddenly the pilot veered the plane and he went straight up into the air like that. Ah, what in the world is happening? I looked at the guy next to me and I said, what has just happened? And he said something that totally shocked me. He said, the pilot missed the runway. (laughs) The pilot missed the runway. (laughs) And as a result, he had to take that big bird and fly it straight up and then come down. And the second attempt, he, he did make the runway. So what am I saying and what's the significance of that story? For the child of God who knows Jesus in a personal way, at the time of our passing, he never misses the runway. Never misses the runway. And we hold on to that with an amazing and a great sense of confidence today. It's a great day to be a follower of Christ. We really can rest assured. We can rest assured with our past, with our present, and with our future. Today, I encourage you to walk in the light of that insurance. Walk in the light of that confidence and enjoy the blessing that is yours to rest assured. Let's pray.